As a single father, I'm raising my kid. Amy, who is 12 years old, is her name. I've always been so bashful, especially with women, that sometimes I can't even think of what to say. I was therefore sure that I was not made out for romance and had given up on the idea of romance since high school. I was certain that I would live a solitary existence. But my manager came to my quiet, diligent self with a request for a matchmaker. I was nearly 10 years older than the woman in question. She would not be pleased with someone like me, a young lady. The problem is that, when we considered the kind of man she was hoping to find, you were the only one who qualified. What standards did she have? Someone quiet and somber, someone who doesn't have a greedy streak and wants a calm life. There aren't any young men that meet this description. Is she really all right? All right with me? It's true that she liked you when she viewed your photo. Really, would you be open to meeting her? I met Eliza, my wife, in this manner. Eliza had gorgeous long hair and glowing skin, making her rather endearing. Our first meeting as matchmakers didn't go well because we were both quiet and introverted and Elisa's mother and my boss nearly gave up on us. Nonetheless, we were able to communicate silently about our feelings, enjoying the beauty of our surroundings without using words, grinning when our gazes met, and witnessing her eyes glitter at the same vista. It was sufficient for mutual understanding. I had never met somebody with whom I could have these kinds of experiences. After two years of gradually fostering our love for one another, we were married. Eliza was 22 and I was 35 when our daughter Amy was born. Amy, in contrast to us, had a boundless enthusiasm for running. When Eliza was five years old, I used to see her frequently trying to keep up with her in our backyard but always falling short. You're really not athletic as expected. I've been unsteady all my life. Always. I missed physical education and sports days at school. Eliza appeared to have been physically frail from an early age. Rather, she possessed other abilities. She was an amazing artist, to start with. Her oil works, for example, truly merited an exhibition. Recently, her painting at an exhibition was purchased for a significant sum of money by someone who admired it. Maybe one day you'll become a famous artist and I won't have to work anymore. You do. Realize that an artwork only gains value upon the artist's passing? In his day, Mona herself was chastised. Look at how revered he is now. Oh my goodness! Who then purchased your painting? A New York hospital director desired it for his facility. Claims to calm the sufferers. That makes sense. Your paintings have a calming effect, like a gentle mito. Thank you, glad to hear. Though our narrative may not be spectacular, I think we've created a happy home together. As a result, I still have clear memories of that day and am unable to forget it. I decided to stop by a bakery to pick up a cake for Amy and Eliza on my way home from work. I thought Eliza had been a little depressed lately. I hadn't spent much time with her because I was preoccupied with work. It appeared as though she was deep in contemplation, perhaps upset by something, but it was simply a feeling. Amy likes apple pie, Eliza prefers cheesecake, and I'll go for the classic chocolate cake. That was the moment a black limousine came up in front of the opulent hotel across the street and I cautiously left the store, being careful not to shake the box. I was curious to see who would emerge from a car I would never link with my life. As expected, a man clad in a suit that appeared custom-fitted for his affluent build appeared. The woman who emerged from the door he opened for her startled me. Eliza was the one, she had more makeup than I had ever seen, was wearing a gorgeous suit, and as she took the man by the arm to stand up, she smiled shyly. Then, almost in unison, they went into the hotel. Eliza, it might have been someone who just looked like Eliza. In a panic, I took out my phone and gave her a call. The woman holding the man's hand pulled her phone out of her purse after a few rings, but she quickly placed it back. My phone informed me that the call had been declined at the same moment. Amy was being looked after by Johanna, Eliza's mother, when I got home. Johanna, do you know where Eliza might be right now? She did mention that she had some errands to run. I'm not sure. Her voice was tremulous with emotion, obviously hiding something. It appeared that her mother was aware that Eliza had been seeing another man behind my back, even if I didn't want to accept this. Thank you for watching Amy today, but I'm sorry I have to ask you to leave now. Johanna appeared to have something to say, but she walked out, bidding Amy 
farewell and sensing my ire. Amy searched my face as she gazed up at me, but I forced a grin and showed her the cake we would be having after supper. It was almost 10 p.m. when Eliza finally made it home. You're back late. Enjoyed a pleasant meal with a friend. You were back, Mum said when she called, and you looked angry. Are you aware of the reason? I'm upset. You observed that? You were with another man. That much was evident to me. I take it you've been unfaithful? While keeping her head down, she did not refute it. For what length of time, don't tell me, wait. Prior to our marriage, that man was obviously married, so Eliza had picked a covert man who didn't appear likely to voice any complaints. My head was flooded with phrases of anguish the more doubt I had. Then she said, please, let's have a divorce. Not responding to any of that. More than rage, I felt hopelessness at those remarks. I hoped she had refused it in a fit of pique, perhaps out of loneliness. I could have forgiven her then. Still, she had interrupted me. All I could sense was that. You're leaving me, I said, apologizing for my own selfishness. She got to her feet, stumbled, and fell onto the couch. But I was unwilling to assist her. She eventually got up slowly, picked up her pocketbook, and walked out of the house. Nothing much happened when Eliza and I got divorced. Amy came under my care. Resolved not to give up, I concentrated on parenting my daughter and we purposefully lived our daily lives. I made sure to write in her teacher's communication books and the school newsletters, and I made sure to attend all of the events. To avoid relying on prepared food, I even perfected the technique of cooking ahead of time on my days off. Happy birthday, Amy. Dad, thank you. I made Amy a cake and handed her the gift I had planned. Whoa. I'm grateful. It's really adorable. A stylish bag that year was the ideal present for her, as she would be entering middle school the next year. I wonder what mum got me for Christmas this year. Whoa. A scarf and some pink gloves. They'll come in handy when it cools off. Eliza had been allowed to see Amy only once after the divorce, but on Amy's birthday each year, she had sent gifts. Since I couldn't bring myself to conceal them or discard them, I gave Amy the items, but I secreted away in a drawer the letters that arrived with them. This year doesn't include a painting for Mum. Because of Amy's remark, I realized that for the first time. Yes, every year there had been a little framed painting. Maybe a masterpiece will arrive later, right? However, the painting never showed up. Later. Eliza's mother, Johanna, would call me to tell me why there wasn't a painting that year. I'm sorry to call out of the blue, although I haven't reached out in seven years. No problem, but why call now? The thing is, Eliza passed away last month. She passed away? I was hard-pressed to believe what I was hearing. There was something she made me promise not to tell anyone. Make a vow? What topic are you discussing? She suffered from ALS. It's an illness that renders you immobile due to muscle atrophy. ALS? Did you fail to notice Eliza's increased tendency to tumble before our divorce? Looking back, I could recall Eliza falling a lot in the backyard as she played chase with Amy. She too faltered and had trouble getting to her feet when she declared her desire for a divorce. Could it have been? Eliza wasn't cheating, despite what you believed. The hospital director who had purchased her painting was the man she was dating on that particular day. She had always wanted to visit a castle and dress up like Cinderella. Upon discovering Eliza's ALS diagnosis, the director purchased an additional picture by Eliza and gave it to the hotel. He asked her to come see her picture hanging beneath the chandeliers, to see herself dressed up in her own painting, rather than in a castle or with a prince on a white horse. Why didn't Eliza say anything about it? Her concerns were you and Amy's future. Eliza believed that sticking by your side shouldn't be a burden. I fell back into a chair, dazed. Johanna said that Eliza's illness was the kind that became worse very quickly. Before she knew it, she had trouble swallowing meals and was unable to move her arms or legs as she pleased. She spent the previous seven years confined to a wheelchair, dependent on a feeding tube for sustenance and ventilator dependent. She started one final painting. Are you interested in having it? Yes, I'll come to pick it up. How did I get here? In a fit of emotion, I decided to get a divorce without having a formal discussion. 
I never thought Eliza would have to make a choice this important. It was unbearable to consider that she was going through all of that by herself, and I started crying uncontrollably. I opened the drawer and removed the letters I had stashed inside till then. It must have been difficult for her to move her hands, as Johanna mentioned. Her handwriting was so crooked over time that it was difficult to read. Even the typewritten letters have gotten shorter in recent years. Every year Eliza, who was not particularly good at writing, would send us little paintings for Amy. How did she paint that? The following Sunday we spent time at Johanna's place after I told Amy everything. Oh Amy, look, you've grown so much. We were greeted by a crying Johanna, and I was overcome with regret. Grandma, I'm sorry I don't remember much about you, but you're the one who used to make pancakes, right? Mum said no, but you always added a lot of honey. Well, yes, we did have those times. Johanna gave Amy a hug as joy and tears mixed. We observed an artwork in the living room of a cheerful mother carrying a child with angel wings. Could it be, this baby is me? Yes, that's correct. Your mother is the angel. It symbolizes her resolve to always be there for you and keep an eye on you, even after she passed gone. So Mum is still holding me now? Amy stepped up to the artwork and gave it a light touch. Even though it was unfinished, it was brimming with affection. How did Eliza manage to paint this? Eliza couldn't move her neck, so she held the brush in her mouth and moved it slightly with her tongue. She worked on it day after day in this manner. I had no idea what to say. I'd like to pick up painting. Dad, is that all right? Color? Yes, I would like to complete this artwork. Yes, that sounds like something only you can do. I understood that I had robbed Eliza and Amy of their time together. I had no objections if Amy was able to relate to Eliza's emotions through interacting with the artwork. Johanna, thank you for being there for Eliza until the end. I am, after all, her mother. Additionally, if you don't mind, please continue to be connected with Amy. Amy needs the maternal warmth and care that I am unable to provide. Amy and Johanna turned to stare at me in shock. Is that okay with you, Fred? Yes, Amy. You're saying you want to see Grandma? Of course I do, and I want to know more about Mum and see her paintings. Thus, Eliza's artwork helped to mend the once broken ties that formerly bound our family. I promised the angel in her artwork that I would bring Amy happiness. Don't worry, I'll take care of your mother. We will be a content family this time. Continue keeping an eye on us. To follow his lead and discard this incredible bunch of people, our sisters and parents, my chosen family is the one that supports me during my difficult times. If he so chooses, he can select his only fans. Goodbye. When I hang out with his mum and sister, at least I won't have to see him. Update 3 Alright, so I went over to his mom's house and we watched maths together, along with her sister. We drank wine, watched TV, and didn't really chat about anything. It all got too much when I eventually said I needed to use the restroom and chose to go to his former room. So many moments and memories that I had deeply treasured. I lay there for a very long time just doing nothing. I broke down after having an extremely horrible panic attack and felt like I was about to pass out. We all simply sat in his room crying as they came up to see how I was doing. In all honesty, I don't think I've ever felt so lost and shattered in my life. I know this sounds pitiful and I'd love to pretend I'm some boss chick. I had loved that man since the day I met him, and I truly did love him with all of my heart. It amazes me that it's over. It feels more like a death than a breakup, rather it feels like the love of my life has suddenly passed away. I'm feeling numb. It became too much, and after my parents got off work, his mum took me home. While his mother met with my parents, our sisters went to pick up my automobile. I believe that I was shocked. Everything just sounded muffled, like I was underwater, and I was unable to talk. I went to sleep, and have just now woken up. Everyone has gone to bed at 11.39, but I'm still up. I really do feel disoriented. A part of me wants to contact him and cry, and ask him to fix things, to tell me it's not real, to go back in time. I understand that is foolish. I'm aware that I should be treated better. However, since the day we first met, I have spent every week of my life with him. Without him, I'm not sure how to survive. I'm having trouble breathing. All I want is for this to be a nightmare. Talk about a rendezvous in Paris, please. 
Catching your partner frolicking about the city of love while serving up a side order of betrayal is the epitome of saying bonjour. When you have the enormous chutzpah of adultery, why needs the Eiffel Tower? Bravo for creating such a fantastic text template. Who knew that experiencing emotional disintegration could sound so poetic? We've all experienced those weak times in his former room, so no worries. Nothing compares to a good old-fashioned emotional meltdown, particularly when it occurs at the location of a crime. Be positive, OP. Perhaps your next chapter will read more happily ever after, rather than like a telenovela. In the meantime, pour yourself a glass of wine and keep in mind that self-care goes best with retaliation. How were you made aware of the other woman?